Many of us think when we follow Jesus, our lives would get better and better. No more obstacles, no more struggles, no more doubt. But in reality, life still happens. It has ups and downs, moments of faith and doubt, moments of victory, and moments of defeat. It isn't smooth, it isn't clean, sometimes it's a mess. And we get tangled and trapped in the mess. And where is Jesus in all of it? That's what messy spirituality is all about. Hey everybody, how are you guys doing today? Great to have you, yeah! Awesome, excited to be in church. Also, shout out to our church online. You may not know this because you come here in person, but we have a, at or about over a thousand people every week join us from somewhere else on the planet, four different continents, lots of different states. So can we hear it for our online church as well? We're so glad that you guys were with us. Jump in the chat, tell us, and also shout out to our prayer team, our hosts, all of you guys, you're amazing. Uh, we are, are in our series, Messy Spirituality. This is our all-in series. That means we're all doing it. We're talking about it. We're, we're, we're diving into it. This is what groups are talking about. This is what Cape Men is talking about. This is what Beloved is talking about. We want to grow together. And, 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 and if you haven't already joined a group, jump in one. We had 250 men on Tuesday. We had seven, uh, 600 women on Thursday and Friday. Our youth are doing it. We have 75 groups. We have a place for you, so don't just come on the weekend, but let's dive into this. And, and I love it because it's such a beautiful picture of what it means to follow Jesus. Messy spirituality makes sense because life is messy, amen? Amen. Uh, and so what is messy spirituality? We got it from the book, but essentially, messy spirituality is where the real Jesus meets the real you. It's a collision course from all of who Jesus really is and all of who you really are, the good, the bad, the ugly, the upfront and the hidden. And when that happens, transformation happens, revolution, revelation happens, uh, and, and it's so powerful. And so we wanna give you permission to be human and show you the real Jesus at the same time. Anybody ready? Anybody ready to go? All right, let's do it. So um, what we talked about last week, we're gonna continue the conversation. And, and really the premise of this is, is that we understand that spirituality is not a formula, but it's a relationship. It's not a formula, but it's a relationship. If those of you who are new here, we are one of those churches where when the pastor says something that is true, we say amen, hooty hoo, dilly dilly, holla back, say it again, preach it. Like you guys kind of missed your cue there where it's early, it's fine. Um, online, you can like hands up, like whatever you want to do. So I'll give you a do over on this one. Spirituality is not a formula, but it's a relationship. Amen. There it is, yeah, amen, amen. Woo, -hoo. there we go. So Let's, let's dive into this week's message. And as we do, let me tell you about one of my favorite things growing up. So I uh, grew up born and raised in Nebraska, cornfield. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yes, go Big Red. Uh, uh, cornfields everywhere, a few small ponds we would fish in. In our ponds, we could see across to the other side. But my mom was from Michigan, and so we would spend every July in Michigan. We would always go up there for the whole month. I don't know, uh, most of you are from the north. You figured out. Actually, all of you online right now, you're in Minnesota, and you're in Michigan, and you're in Wisconsin because it's 3,000 degrees down here right now, so you already know what I'm talking about. But July is a great time to be in Michigan, and she didn't just live in Michigan, but she grew up five miles from Lake Michigan. And so while we were at Michigan, we spent a ton of time at the lake, the big lake, and we loved it these Midwest boys, because it was like the ocean, but no sharks, no eels. You could open your eyes underwater. Like, it was like the ocean, but it was freshwater and all stuff, and we loved it, and so we would just spend, I mean, and we were that family. We would bring the cooler. We would bring the towels, the, all the stuff. We'd have a time. We'd spend the day there, and we were those guys, me and my brother especially. We hit the sand. We're gone, and I don't remember what age this happened. I think I was about uh, probably nine or ten, and my brother was about seven or eight, but we were notorious for, like, we wouldn't come out for anything. It was just go, 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 and I, I remember being about eight or nine, and my, like I said, nine or ten. My brother was seven or eight. And we were just going, we were playing. We had set up our stuff and we just hit the water. We're jumping, we're playing, we're wrestling, we're doing, we're diving, we're doing, we're diving, it's all this stuff. And it's like, we're just going and 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. It's probably been an hour. And all of a sudden we're like, man, like I need a snack. You know, like I need, I need something to drink. It's been a minute, we're going. And so we finally, we were just so in our own world having a great time. And then we, we looked up and when we went to go back to get our stuff, our parents were gone. All of our stuff was gone. The umbrella was gone, no towels, no cooler. And we were like, they've threatened to do this before, but they never actually did it. And we kind of panicked. 
And we're like, where are they? We look up, like, no, they were there. We look to the left, they weren't there. We look to the right, they weren't there. And we kind of panic, so we're like, we got to get out, we got to figure it out. As long as we're together, we can take anybody. After all, I'm nine, you're seven. And so we started, like, trying to figure it out. And we marched, we marched down the beach, and we look, like, 200 yards this way. And there's our tent, or our, our umbrella, our towels, our cooler, and we come storm at our parents like, why did you move everything? We were afraid. We, why did you move 200 yards down the beach? And they're both just laughing. And we're like, we didn't move. We're like, yes, you did. You were, you, why'd you do that to us? They're like, you boys have been playing for so long. What you didn't know is this big lake has an undertow. It has a current. There's a pole. You jumped in the water and you weren't watching and paying attention to us, but we were keeping our eye on you. And for the last hour, little by little, you guys have been drifting, and when you looked up, we weren't gone. You had just saw something else. We didn't know about the current. We didn't know about the drift. We didn't know about the undertow. Now, we all live near the Gulf of Mexico. Like, you could hit, like, a driver to it from here. Like, the Gulf of Mexico is no, the same, right? We have a word for it, the drift, the undertow. And we learned, and then, and then every sense from then, we were like, no way. And so we did it again. We looked, and we're like, oh, my gosh, that's really true. They're right. Who knew? And, 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 and there was this pull and this drift. And I tell you that because I want, I want us to be very aware, and this is so important, that it's important that you understand that the exact same thing happens to us spiritually. We lose focus on the one that brought us to the water and we make it about what's going on in the water. And there is a constant drift. There is a pull. There is an undertow. And it's probably not what you think. I'm not gonna say what you think I'm gonna say. It's, some of you are like, yeah, it's the world. I'm not talking about the world. The world is a storm. You can see the storm coming. If you've read the Bible for like five minutes, you're like, okay, I got it. World, kingdom of heaven. There's something way more important there. I wanna talk about a current, a drift. I wanna talk about the undertow, a current that's happening that we can't really see, that we are all susceptible to. And truthfully, it's really, really, really hard to recognize and self-identify. In fact, I think this might be one of the most difficult messages I ever preach because anyone I'm talking to most of them think I'm talking about someone else. Yes. Like, oh man, that really stinks for them. Ugh. And so I want to talk about hijacked spirituality. That's the message. Last week was messy spirituality. This week I want to talk about hijacked. I want to talk to you about the number one thing that I will take to my grave that will compromise and hijack your relationship with God. I believe we're, it's the, your greatest threat to your relationship with Jesus. And it is not sin. It is not the world. It is not suffering. It is not apathy. It is not even a lack of faith. I believe the greatest threat to your relationship with Jesus is this thing called religion. And when I say religion, we're not gonna bash any churches. We're not gonna bash any denominations. We don't do that here, but we gotta call spades spades if we're gonna be the followers of Jesus he called us to be. And I will take to my grave that nothing will hijack your relationship with Jesus more than religion. Let me just explain for a second. Let me give you a thought. Jesus' great opponent when he was on the earth was not the empire of Rome. It was not death. He rose people from the dead. It was not sickness. That was no problem for him. It was not needy people. That was no problem for him. Do you know who his greatest opponent was in the three years he did ministry? Organized religious, elite religious system, religion. The only, the, the only people that Jesus really couldn't reach or get through to were religious people, not hurting people, not broken people, not even Romans. Jesus, his life, his message, and his movement were the greatest threat to the religious system, not the Roman Empire, and not the have-nots. In fact, the group that eventually killed Jesus was religion. It was the religious leaders of his tribe of the day. In fact, I love how the author of our book that we took this from puts it when he kind of talks about this. He says this, according to the critics, and this is dead on, Jesus did God all wrong. He went to the wrong places. He said the wrong things. And worst of all, he just let anybody into the kingdom. He goes on to say, what made people furious was Jesus's irresponsible habit of throwing open the doors of his love to the whosoever's the just anyoneers and the not a chancers like you and me. And so we got to talk about it. And I will, and this is not just a belief. This is my experience. This is my journey that I believe that, th that religion will be the thing that will keep you from Jesus more than anything else. 
And so what do we mean? I think it's important. What do we mean when we say religion? Let me just make it really, really simple. I'm talking about rules just for the sake of rules. I'm talking about custom and rituals just for the sake of custom and rituals. Uh, and, and actually, I wanna use, I wanna come back to the formula. And there's all kinds of formula, but it always goes the same way. It's the if-then formula. You know what I mean by that? It's if I do fill in the blank, then I get fill in the blank, good and bad. If I give, God should bless me. If I sin, God hates me. If I lie, I should be cursed. If I'm generous, God owes it to me. If I pray, I deserve to be answered. If I run from God, I deserve what I, like it's, it's if then on all of it. There's, a, there's, a, there's literally a formula and it's custom and rituals and, 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 and all those things so that you can get closer to God. That's what we mean when we mean religion. Now, listen, I wanna say something because a lot of us come from different backgrounds. If you take the sacraments and every time you take the sacraments, it makes you more like Jesus, connects you to Jesus, and you feel Jesus, take the sacraments every day. But don't take the sacraments because of the sacraments. Take the sacraments because it makes you more like Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? Essentially, it's this. God isn't, doesn't care about your, your uh, uh, customs. He wants your heart. And that's what we're talking about. And religion focuses all about customs. In fact, Jesus told, there's a whole narrative in the, in the gospels where he's like, look at the religious people who lived the best outward lives, tithed on everything, prayed all the time, had long prayer tassels. And he goes, y'all are dead inside. You're whitewashed tombs. The outside of your cup and dish is, is great, but the inside is full of greed and self-indulgence. That's literally what Jesus said. And what Jesus was pretty strict with religion. Why? Because he's like, I know this will be the thing because it's kind of this, like you started, I brought you to the water. You started in the water and it was great, but you've made it more about the water and now you've drifted and you forgot that it's about the one you came with. It's the goodness scale. We said it last week. We'll put it back up. Religion is what introduces us to the sin scale or the badness scale. Some things are, are horrible and terrible and some things are kind of moderate and some things are mostly okay. And in church, these are okay, but these aren't okay. And it's this tier system and it's this caste system. And it just, there's no place for it when it comes to following Jesus. And I want to challenge some of us and I want to set some of us free if that's all right. And so let's talk about it for a minute. Again, what is religion when we talk about it? I'm just saying customs and rituals and behaviors that either move you closer to God or further to God based on those customs or rituals. And it also, if there's anything that tells you to how you can know where someone else is, well, you're here because you do this. You got divorced, so you're here. You, like, that's religion. And Jesus, he infuriated these guys. And so let's talk about it. Now, here's why I think it's done really, really well for the last 2,000 years. In fact, like 3,500. There's an appeal to religion that we have to be careful. There's a pull, there's a drift, there's an undercurrent. First of all, it's safer. It's actually safer for our plans because we're in control of it. It's also much safer because we just have to focus on the outside and we never really have to look on the inside. It's easier to control. It's easier to measure, to know who's where and what's where and where do we put everything. And here's, I think, the real appeal. It requires much less thought and almost no inward focus. It, it, essentially, religion is what focuses on doing not being. The appeal to religion is I, don't, I can unplug my mind and I can unplug my heart. And as long as I say this prayer, give this tithe or, or do this sacrament, I'm good. And Jesus is all about our heart. And so that's what I mean. It's, it's, it's anything that unplugs and detaches our heart and our mind. And Jesus says, love me with all of your heart, not love me with all of your actions. Change your mind. He talks about our mind. And so it's, 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 there's an appeal to it because it's like, it tells us where everything fits. It's, let me use this. It's cleaner. Following Jesus is messy, but there's also some dangers. The dangers of religion is it leads to blindness to our own humanity and need for a savior regularly, not just one time. It, leads to, it leaves us empty. The, the, mo, the, the most religious people I know, there's no joy. There's no grace. There's no peace. They just look like they eat lemons all day and they hate everybody. You're terrible and God is good. I'm like, oh, tell me more. The biggest danger in religion, I think, is it leads to tons and tons of judgment and a cold heart. Piety, at least we're not like them. I can't believe they. Did you know she? I can't believe he. And here's the biggest danger of it. Jesus was against it, and it was against Jesus. Jesus didn't care about the Roman Empire. You know that, right? Do you know who he cared about? A religious system that was oppressing people. Do you know who he super loved? All the broken, lost outsiders who he's like, no, there's room in my kingdom. This thing is messy and it will challenge us. And that's why we say following Jesus is not a formula, it's a relationship. If you want a good picture of what religion is, it's the older brother in the prodigal son story. It's the older brother. Again, I have a master's degree, probably PhD in being the older brother. So I know of this. 
And why do I say it's not a formula? Because nobody would go into a marriage with a formula, right? Before you guys come together. Do you promise to unplug your mind, unplug your heart, and as long as you give him sex, he washes the dishes and you both do the laundry, you'll make it. Y'all sounds good. I just don't want to have to think about it at all and I really don't want her to have my heart. Just tell me what to do. <laughs> no, that's a terrible marriage. That's not how marriage counseling goes at this church. That marriage by formula is no good. Give me your heart but we do it with Jesus. And so what I want to spend a little bit of time, just a few minutes on each, I want to give you three saboteurs of spirituality. And again, everything straight from the Bible, straight from the life and words of Jesus. Don't take my word for it ever. I'm not that good and I'm not that smart and you should not trust me, but you should trust this. And so I want to show you two stories, three saboteurs of, 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 of spirituality that we got to watch out for both that happened to us, but also as importantly that we're not doing to other people. Come on, somebody. Not just with our mouth, but even in our mind and in our heart. So the first one, is in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 18. Um, we see this, and there's a lot in these stories, but I'm just gonna pull a couple things out. Luke chapter 18, we see another time, just like the setting last week with Zacchaeus, Jesus is heading from Jer Jericho. Verse 35, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard him going by, he asked what was happening, and they told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. So this blind man, just like Zacchaeus, had heard that Jesus was different, that he might heal me, that he might have what I need. He's like, I gotta get to him. Same exact type of a scenario as last week, which is what our message was. And so he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But those who led the way rebuked him and told him, shh, be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And I can guarantee you this, everybody will have at least a time or a season in your life, whether you yell it out or it's in your heart that you get desperate enough that you don't care what anybody else thinks, you just need what Jesus has. In your finances, in your freedom, in your healing, in your marriage, if it's your kids, you need a miracle. It might be a medical diagnosis. And it's, it's like the person who's drowning doesn't care what they gotta do to get air. When you're spiritually drowning, Jesus, like, shh, whatever. And they try to silence him and it says, watch this. He wasn't having it, he peered up all the more. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked a hilarious question. What would you like me to do? I feel like you're pretty smart. I feel like this one's pretty obvious. <laughs> Lord, I want to see, he replied. And Jesus said, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. Again, so much in this story, but I want to introduce you to the first saboteur of your spirituality. And these are the silencers. Shh, don't be excited. Don't bring God to work. Don't bring God to the internet. Keep it quiet. Don't raise your hands in worship. Don't be excited about Jesus. Don't tell your friends about me. Don't invite people to church. You, you're, keep your story to yourself. That's awkward. You're making it uncomfortable. These are the people that will silence you. Don't, don't express yourself in worship. Don't, don't pray loudly. No. You, there, we're all gonna have different ways of silencer. Now, hold on. Some of you got, I gotta cl clarify this. I'm not just giving you a green light for chaos in the gathering. Paul has a lot to say about that in Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 as well. But what I am saying is, if you need Jesus or he's done something, don't be quiet about it. And religion will try to silence you to go, that's not how it looks, feels. We shouldn't tell your story. You shouldn't say that about, listen, I, this is what I know. I was this, Jesus found me, and this is what I am. Like, I'm not that smart. I don't know all about it, but I, like, I gotta tell somebody. And there's lots of silencers in religion. We don't like it when messy people sp speak up. Don't be too real. Don't be too authentic. Don't say something you shouldn't say. Listen, the people who are trying to silence you, they didn't give you your shout, so they can't control your shout. The God that gave, like, so if you, like, Silence. Some of you try to be silenced. Some of you have silenced others. No, that's, that's not how we pray here. That's not how we dress here. That's not how we act here. Then get out and find a place that looks more like Jesus. Because my Bible, like, again, anybody, anywhere, whatever. Pastor, is it okay if we wear swim trunks to church because we're going to the beach afterwards? Yeah. Pastor, we know some people wear swim trunks to church, but we're more traditional. Can I wear a suit? Yeah. You guys should sit together. It'll be awesome. We don't freaking care. Why? Because too many of us have been made to feel a certain way by walking into a religious environment because we didn't look right, act right, dress right, whatever. Man, if it were up to me, I'd be wearing a Husker shirt, like shorts to here and my Nebraska shoes. Like, but I'm a pastor and I have a little bit of decency and I'm on the internet. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> There's a real story, a uh, true story about a young, man, a young gal who lived in a, a city and she, she was beautiful, successful. She was on a path for a really great career, C-suite in the business world. And God really got a hold of her heart. And she started working with uh, the inner city with, uh, with her church. They started seeing more young people and ethnic people coming. And so she volunteered to be the youth person. And then they hired her and she left her job like a great one to start working with these kids. And she started a Bible study for gang members. 
And so she would invite them in and, and they liked her and she liked them and she was just welcoming and they were like, this is crazy. And so they would have Bible study at the church and one day she was talking about, you gotta love Jesus more than your gang and your mom and your girlfriend. And one of the gang members got so mad, they were like, oh, following Jesus is hard. And when they did that, they broke the window. And the church was more upset about a $26 broken window than the fact that they had gang members coming twice a week to Bible study and they asked them not to come to Bible study anymore. But one day, in that same time, the pastor accidentally walked in not knowing they were having Bible study and the gang members liked him and he liked them. They're like, this guy's awesome. Like, yeah, he's the pastor. Like, we don't even know what that means, but he's cool. And so she's like, well, you guys should come to church on the weekend. So the story actually gets worse. So they come in and they were like, hey, um, we're not ready for you down here. Can you guys sit up in the balcony? So they put him in the balcony. And then they did all the things and the pastor comes up to give the message. And one of the gang members who had just met him the week before is like, hey, dude, you're awesome. We remember you. And they got shushed and silenced and glared at because they were disrupting the gathering. And at the end of the service, they asked the youth worker, please don't ever bring them back to church here. And then they fired the youth worker. Silencers. You don't look right. You got too much issues. You brought your mess. You smell like alcohol. You smell like weed. Those were the same clothes you were in yesterday. I didn't come for the sick. Or I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. I didn't come for the found. I came for the lost. I didn't come for the, the right? Silencers. The next person, let me move on to the next one we see, is a guy named Levi. Uh, Levi is also known as Matthew. Matthew is the, the guy who wrote the book of Matthew. Well, uh, Levi was a tax collector. Tax collector. Remember how we feel about tax collectors? So what we know is Levi was the last, we think he was the last disciple of Jesus. And Jesus walks into his life and he's like, hey, come follow me. And Levi's like, you talking to me? He's like, yeah. So he invites himself to Levi's house. So Jesus and his disciples and Levi and his friends are at the house. And it's like, what's going on here? And the disciples are like, yeah, we don't really know. We kind of just started following this guy too. Um, but we got, you got Peter, at the zealot at the end who hated tax collectors in the empire. And so he's like, Peter, you're over there. Levi, you're here. Let's do the fisherman in the middle. I'll be here. That's all kinds of accurate cultural contracts, by the way. And so he's there having dinner. And so there's a dinner party. And what is it? It's like, hey, we're going to celebrate. I think Levi, the cheat and the scoundrel, is going to go be a follower of Jesus. He just said, come follow me, but we're not really sure. It was literally his onboarding party. It was like the syllabus, first day. Like, this is what this means. Like, who are these guys? A bunch of fishermen. I don't know those guys. A bunch of dumb fishermen. Like, hey, we're with him too. Like, how does this work? We don't really know, but let's eat and have a party. Same setting as last week, Matthew 9. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Of course they did. It's all they knew. It's like tax collectors and sinners. And the disciples are like, yeah, actually, that's kind of us too. We're B team, not rabbi school. Nobody picked us. But like, we just keep following this guy and he says, keep going. So we're like, keep going. Like, this is crazy. We don't even know. And it says, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? If I'm a disciple, I'm like, yeah, we don't know either. But I find it interesting that the religious people went to his disciples. They didn't go to him. See, that's what religious people do. Hey, why is that happening? Hey, I'm not going to talk to the pastor or church board member. Like, have you noticed? Have you noticed the lights are a little loud? Do you view the music's a little loud? We don't, we sing, we don't sing hymns anymore. We don't sing hymns anymore. We, have you noticed? Uh, pastor Corey doesn't preach as many weekends as we wish. Uh, 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 we should do, we, we, that's Jesus. Right? Religious people like to talk to everybody except for Jesus about their problems. Hope your toes are okay. <laughs> but that's just bonus content because really the whole point is the second saboteur is the name caller. Name caller, that's kind of a kid. Okay, how about this? These are the ones that put labels on people. They take your worst moment, your worst season, your worst thing, and then they make that who you are, your identity. Adulterer, liar, failure, thief, whatever. It's, they take a moment and make that your identity. That's what religious people do. And then that defines you forever. And it's like, you're still paying the, you're still paying the prices for stuff you did 15, 20, 30 years ago, uh, two years ago, 16 months ago, because religious people told you like, you're still in the penalty box and you haven't done enough things to get to God. These are the name callers, ungodly, uncommitted, unspiritual. And again, Jesus hears all this. He's like, hey, what'd you ask the disciples? <laughs> It says this, on hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. So last week he tells Zacchaeus, I came for the lost. And this week he tells Levi, I came for the, the unhealthy, the sick. Are we seeing a trend in a pattern here? I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. This drove religious people crazy. And some of us have been walking around with a label 
for a long time. And, and I'm going to submit that you can lay that at the altar tonight. You can leave that at the feet of Jesus. He'll take your label and your new label is redeemed, love, son or daughter of the most high. Like trade your label in. But there is another group. Some of us, we're pretty good at labels. Your challenge isn't to put your label down, it's to put the pen down and stop writing on people's label. You maybe don't say it out loud, but you think it, you say it at home. They, they got what they deserve. They, uh, some of us could give Jesus our label, but some of us religious people, if we would dare be courageous enough to think he might be talking to us today, could lay our pen at the altar as well and be like, I'm, I'm done giving people labels. That's what religious people do. Sinners, tax collectors, harlots, adulterers, woman caught in adultery, John 8, woman at the well, John 4. I mean, the whole gospel is just the wrong people, the wrong time, the wrong situation. And everybody loved it except the religious people. And in both stories, we see the third group. And the third group aren't just in both stories. They're every place he fed people, every place he healed people, every single place he taught, every single place he raised people from that, this third group of people. They were the ones that had a problem with everything that Jesus did. And they were never okay with what he was doing. They were never okay with how he was doing it. And they were rarely, if ever, okay with whom he was doing it with. 4,000 people on that side of the lake? What are you talking about? This woman? What are you talking about? Don't you know what she does? Don't you know how she got that perfume? Don't you know where she got that way? Don't you know what he used to do? Don't you know what, like literally read the gospels. They're everywhere. And these are doing alive and well today in this day and age as well. And these are the kingdom monitors and condemners. Scorekeepers. What? You see what they put on Facebook? They sent an email. Are you, did you hear what happened at the prayer chain? Oh, wait, okay, they can't be in leadership. They can't hold a door. Let's see, he got divorced 30 years ago. He can't be a greeter. Um, oh, and they're loads of fun. They're super nice people. Who? Why didn't God answer that prayer? Well, whose sin was it? What was it? Parents' sin? Was it your sin? Like what's, you know, God's, God's probably still angry at them. That's why they can't get pregnant. That's why he can't get a promotion. Come on, somebody. How about shut up? You ain't God and you don't know. Here's the litmus test. And this has been my journey. But you want to know what just angers religious people more than anything? grace. It drives them nuts. What do you mean she got the promotion? She only got saved a week ago. She still drinks, still cusses, and she's not even good to her boyfriend. Grace. How come you haven't answered my prayer? I pray fast three times a day. I'm way more holy than all these people, and all I got is a couple kids that don't even care. <laughs> grace. Grace. Grace drives religious people crazy. So how do I know where I'm at? Easy, where's your grace meter? How much do you love it when somebody gets to experience the grace of God versus go, ugh, them? I live on their street and work with her. If they knew what I knew, Lord, are you seeing this? Grace. Grace. For by grace you are saved and not anything you can do. It is the gift of God. So nobody can boast and you can't get to him on your own. That's how Paul wrote it. Grace, grace. I, I love, there's a book called, um, What's So Amazing About Grace. And I don't, Philip Yancey, I think wrote it. I don't know. I don't read full books, just parts of them. Um, but um, he said, if you're not regularly experiencing an uncomfortable amount of grace, you probably don't even understand God's grace at all. That's challenged me for 20 years because I am a justice button, rule following, box checking, fair tier. You didn't, I didn't, I did more. I worked harder, got up earlier, worked out more, prayed more, fasted more, didn't sin. I'm like, ah. And God had to like deliver me. And so my grace meter went from a red deficit to like, I, I like to stay, I stay between the yellow and the green. <laughs> Let me just give you a real quick um, let me get a real quick picture of this, and, and then I want to share a story. Um, there's another story in the Bible, John chapter 9. A blind man is brought to Jesus. And again, all the people are trying to figure out the religious thing. Like, why is he blind? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? And it says, that as, they, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And the disciples asked, these dumb disciples, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? Why was he born blind? 
And he goes, no, guys, it's not about that. I just want to show my glory. And so Jesus spits in mud, heals his eyes. And the guy's like, I can see, I can see. It drives the religious people crazy. They're like, what happened? He's like, a, a guy touched me and I can see. He's like, no, not him. He's like, no, it was, I think it was a rabbi. I don't know. I couldn't see it for most of the time, but I, it was him. <laughs> like, that's what the back of his garment looks like. Not Jesus of Nazareth. He's, he's a blasphemous. He's a bad, he's a poor teacher. And this, the guy has to come before the sin. He has to come before the religious leaders. He's like, listen, I don't know his parents. I don't know where he's from. I don't know where he went to school. I don't even know his ethnicity. I don't know anything about this guy. All I know is I was blind. He touched me and I can see. He flunked religion 101. He's like, I don't know. He might be Jewish. He might be a rabbi. Honestly, don't care. I can see. So permission to know almost nothing about Jesus when you start your journey. Like, I don't know. I was just broken and he started to put the piece back together and I'm like, let's follow this guy. Grace. Let me give you a real quick picture. How can I know? I put a chart together, religion versus relationship. Just five things that I think real quick, you can snapshot this or whatever. It's on the notes uh, if you go on the app. But let me just tell you, give you a couple of pictures of the difference between religion and relationship. Religion says this, I obey, therefore I am accepted. But relationship says, I'm accepted, so I want to obey. Religion's motivated by fear and insecurity. Where do I stand? He's mad at me. But relationship is motivated by love gratitude and joy. In religion, I obey so I can get what I want from God. But in a relationship with God, I obey God to get more of God because I just love being with him. In religion, when things go wrong, it means that God hates me and he's punishing me. But in a relationship with God, when things go wrong, I know Jesus has already paid the punishment for every single one of my sins and he will be with me through this struggle to help me be better on the other side. In religion, my identity is based on how good y'all think I am outside. But my, in relationship, my identity is based on what Jesus did for me on the cross and how much he loves me, and that can never change. So while your opinion of me may change, what he did for me never, ever will. Again, it's, this is why I say following Jesus is not a formula. And again, there's nothing wrong with any of the rituals or customs. If it makes you close to Jesus and connect to Jesus, then do it. But don't do it for its sake. Do it because you want it, Jesus and you want to be like Jesus and all of those things. And so again, I said it, the, the great litmus test. How do I know where I'm at? The two ways that you could look at a mirror is love and grace. What do I mean by love? I'm talking Good Samaritan. What's the story of the Good Samaritan is not helping somebody who got beat up. The story of Good Samaritan is how well do you love somebody who is fundamentally different than you? looks different, different nationality, votes different, thinks different, may never align with you. Can you still love them? That is actually what the story of the Good Samaritan is all about. That's the kind of love. Where am I at with that? And where am I at with grace? Do I celebrate grace going, welcome to the club, God is good? Or am I like, <laughs> why them? For some of us, God is inviting us. I'll bury the lead. We got a few minutes left <laughs> to repent of our religion and go, God. And here's the thing, he's not mad at you. Here's what's happened. You've just been in the water long enough, you've drifted. And he's just calling you back. He's not going, I hope you drown and the sharks get you. He's not saying that. He's saying, guys, the cooler and the, and the tent's over here. Come back. Remember, where, remember how it started? Take me back to where it started. I think we sang that. Take me back to where it started. Don't make it about the water, make it about the one that brought you. And some of us, you've just been labeled and oppressed by religion. I just want to invite you into a relationship. It'll change your life, because I think there are a whole lot of people in our church that can identify with Deb's story. I was raised in a Catholic family. I went to Mass every day. We didn't miss a Sunday, and I mean, very religious about it. I, I, that's the only word I can think of to say, because that's, I mean, we didn't miss anything. We did everything the way you're supposed to do it. I loved God when I was little, but when they would tell me some things about who he was and his character, even though I was not very old, my heart just had a really hard time accepting it. In the Catholic Church, we were not encouraged to read a Bible. We were encouraged to accept what the priest interpreted the Bible to say. So it didn't allow for any exploring or anything. It kind of took all of that away. I'm not a super st studious type person, but I'm adventurous and I like learning and I love to read. And so uh, that probably would have been something in my early life that would have helped me if I would have gone down that kind of a path. But I kind of was discouraged. There were some things I felt like when I was young, I knew in my heart about God, but 
no matter how good I was or no matter how hard I tried to do the right thing, I was never promised that I was going to make it to heaven. It's like climbing a staircase and never getting to the top. I had some friends that invited me to a concert and this concert was not in the Catholic Church. I was not allowed to step foot in any other churches. They had to be Catholic or nothing. And it was a, a Christian concert and they were worshiping and I was hearing about Jesus in a way I never had before. And I liked it a lot. I mean, my heart just opened right up to that. But when my mom found out about it, I got in lots of trouble and then I was forbidden to be around those people anymore. And so that's probably when my journey started going the other way. So I just started hanging out with probably some of the wrong people. Yeah, I was around drugs and alcohol. I, I grew up in a resort area, so summertime was crazy time. My journey back was um, when I met Brian and went, we moved back to where he grew up and I met his mother. His mom was just so full of the love of Jesus. She was so easy to be around and she just talked about Jesus all the time. It took me right back to that time when I was introduced to him, probably the first time. I didn't even realize what that was all about, you know, but I'm sure that's what it was, and God knows. Being around her, it didn't take very long, probably, it was less than two weeks, and she just started talking about Jesus, and I think one day she just said, Deb, would you like to receive Jesus into your heart? And I'm like, yeah. I think for me it was like, I've just been waiting for someone to ask me. God's timing is perfect, it's always, it always is. He's never, he's never early, but he's never late either, you know, so he saved my life. When Brian's mom started sharing Jesus with me, immediately I could see she was talking about a relationship. And I never heard that in the Catholic Church. God was out there, but it was so much more about attaining and earning and getting there. You know, like I said, trying to walk your way up but never feeling like you quite made it. I knew I had a love for God in my heart because when I would go to church, I would talk to him. By the time I met Jesus, I knew he, he was real. He speaks to me frequently through the word or just impressions in my heart, but I always know he's there. It means everything to me. I love my life because I have freedom in it. Not, not because I am perfect or do everything right. He knows me. I know him. I know I, know I have a long way to go but I know him and I, he likes me and I like him. The rules and regulation doesn't ever make it feel like he's real and alive, but he is. I'm of the opinion that that's kind of, that's kind of what you're looking for. If you have a revelation that he likes you, not just loves you, but likes you, and you like him, now you're grooving. And again, I said, this is, not, this is not a knock on any denomination or any sort of church. I'm just saying, have you drifted? Have you drifted? Has a current pulled you without knowing and somewhere 200 yards away is where it started? And the grace meter needs to be filled back up and the love meter needs to be filled back up and we need to stop name calling and labeling and silencing. And it's a time to go, man, God, help me to embrace the relationship. Help me to engage my mind and engage my heart. Some of you, this is what you've been looking for your whole life. See, what you don't know is that story has influenced every single one of you in massive ways. Because that's my mom. I grew up in that house. I grew up in that environment. And for every weekend, I get to speak to all of you as an overflow of what that was. So some of you don't just owe this to your soul, but you owe it to your legacy. You owe it to the future generations, your kids and your grand. Who knows what your kids or grandkids are gonna do because you abandoned religion and said, Jesus, here's all of it. You know what you're gonna find? Grace, holiness. We'll talk about that actually in a couple weeks for those who are worried, we're going there. You may not love it if you're really religious, but it, we're going there. But you're also gonna find freedom. A lot of the stuff you can't get out of on your own, he's gonna help you out of. But he's also not gonna beat you down when you have human moments. Your humanity is the greatest need for the cross and he already took care of it. And so I wanna close and I wanna pray specifically for two groups. And we're all, gonna, we, we're all gonna pray this together. But if you would have the courage to acknowledge, gosh, I need to like repent of religion. I need, or I need, to, I need to come back to the center. I need to like, acknowledge the drift. Just God's ready. He's calling you back. He didn't come to condemn you either. He, 
In John 3, he did take time to talk to a religious person and explain it to him. He has time for that. His name was Nicodemus. He also took time for people who didn't know anything. His arms are open to everybody. And then for some of you, and maybe you even come a long time, you've been coming a while. Maybe this is the moment. We do it every week where you're like, this is the moment where you can abandon religion and go, now I get it. I want the relationship. I want that. And so we're going to pray for both of those things. I'm going to lead us in a prayer that covers both of them, but I want to give you just a moment to bow your heads, reflect, and just think about what is God saying to you today in this moment? The pull is real. It's an undercurrent, and you rarely, if ever, can see it happening. Is it possible that a loving Heavenly Father is calling you back from the undertow? If you're here today or online, and you would say, man, I've drifted into religion and I wanna come back to the heart of God. That's me, include me in that prayer. If that's you, just lift your hand up. And say, that's me, yeah, I see those hands. Yeah, 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 you don't have to leave them up. Awesome, that takes a ton of courage. I think that takes a ton of courage. Is there anybody else on the other side of that would say, man, I, I've been subscribing to religion or, or man, it, I want the relationship. I'm ready to have the relationship with God. Include me, I'm ready to start a relationship with Jesus. Is that anybody here? Just lift your hand online. You can lift your hand. Yeah, hands on both. Awesome, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna lead us all in a very simple prayer and I'm gonna encourage everybody, even if you're online behind a screen, would you repeat this prayer with me as we say this together? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus but he came for messy people like me. Jesus, come in. I've drifted. I want to come back. I want a relationship. I don't want to sabotage my spirituality. I repent for my religion. I see it, and I'm coming home. And Jesus, I'm giving you my religion. And now I want to be your friend. Help me to know you, love you, follow you, and serve you all the days of my life. And when I don't get it right, help me to run to you first. Thank you for loving messy people like me. Now give me your love. Give me your grace so that I can walk in it and express it to others. In Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody give God praise in this house, huh? Hey, listen, if you, uh, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, we want to connect with you and make sure that you understand how to like really get everything out of this relationship. We've made it super easy. Would you just on your way out, get your phone and text the word Cape Yes to 94000. Even if you're somewhere else, we would love to connect with you. And then as always, whether you're online or in person, if you have something you just need prayer for, you want to talk to somebody, we have an online prayer team. We have a prayer team right here in our prayer room. We'd love to do that for you. Um, but for the rest of you, I hope that this kind of stirs in you, um, that we come back to center and that, that, that this week you enjoy God and you know that he enjoys you. Next week, bring somebody with you. Be safe. God bless you guys. Have a great weekend.